particles like these so fast with me. Bombs out of mechanics and pipe up some cold words, but no one can deny the fact that quantum theory works. I want to start this video by revising some basic facts that we know about the atom. The atom itself has protons and neutrons in the nucleus, so center would be the nucleus. Then it has different types of shells, which we can either call the electron shells or the energy shells. And the energy shells would be probably more appropriate because that's more what actually these electrons are arranged in, elect uh, energy levels. Right, so we've got these um, energy levels around it. And we know that the first shell, for example, will have lower energy than the next shell. In this case, in this atom, the second shell is the length shell, which will have again higher energy than the first shell. And that also means that this is the sort of outermost layer of this actual atom. So the valence shell is the outermost layer where they're still positioned nicely. What we also know is that they have to find in a normal atom, by, if the atom is by itself, right, if it's not like in a lattice, so it's not next, if they're not next to each other, then we know that they have to find actual energy levels. So for example, let's say this one has, just as an example, this number is not correct, it's the first shell, all electrons in the first shell have one joule of energy and all the actual electrons in the second shell, let's say they have two joules of energy. And you can see there's a gap in between, there's a gap here. What this gap is, we sometimes call it the forbidden energy gap because if you remember from your quantum theory that you would have covered in the last couple of top points before this actual topic started, you would have talked about the fact that energy is quantized. And what we mean by that is that they come in packages. Energy comes in packages. So for example, again, let's say we have this number scale here, the number line. It goes from 0 to 1 to 2. And let's say our first shell, all electrons had 1 joule in the first shell, and all electrons in the second shell had a bit more energy. They had 2 joules. Now, you, couldn't, you wouldn't find an electron, for example, in the middle of the shell, here, or there, or there. And the reason why is because, let's say, let's take a random number in between 0 and 1. Let's say we take, here, this might be about 0 0.4. According to the quantum theory, energy is, is actually quantized. It's in discrete packages. So in this example, our packages would be jumps of one, right? So the, they could either have one joule of energy or two joules or three joules. They wouldn't be have in between those. They wouldn't be able to have 0 0.4 joules or 1.5 joules, right? They would have to be actual numbers that always go from one to two to three in these packages. And that's why you, you should know when it comes to energy levels. They're always going to be within these energy levels, not in between the energy levels. That's just for electrons. It will have, if the atoms by itself, they will have to find energy levels, and those energy levels will be coming in, in stages and packages. Now, what happens if we add a bit more energy? Well, theoretically, we can have these electrons jumping from the lens shell, which at the moment is the outermost shell, into the next shell, which we'll call the conduction shell. And so, drawing a shell around it. If we add some more energy, let's say, we increase the energy from these different electrons from 1 to 2 joules, which is what it has in the valence shell at the moment, to 3 joules, which it would have in the conduction shell. Then it would jump, one of the electrons would jump from the actual valence shell into the conduction shell. And it would be like almost like a teleportation. It would go from there directly to there. And now one of these electrons has more energy. What do we mean by the conduction shell? The conduction shell is where most of these electrons will conduct electricity. So for example, we've got the same idea here. We have the same atom. We've given one of the atoms a bit more, sorry, we've given one of the electrons a bit more energy. We've, we've maybe given it heat, thermal energy. And now this one will jump to the conduction shell. The conduction shell you can almost imagine to be like your highway. Here there has, it can travel in, in this case in any direction, it can travel without any interference this electron, because there's, it'll just freely float around in the actual atom. There's less resistance in the conduction shell there is in the, there is in the valence shell. In the valence shell, they're often quite closely connected to the atom, whereas in the conduction shell, it can move freely.
Right, so if we move things into conduction shell, they can move freely, these electrons. And when they can move freely, they have the potential to conduct electricity. Right. So far, all I've really just given you is just kind of the gist of when it comes to electrons, where they are located in their different shells, that they have these different energy levels, and that we can move them from, for example, the valence shell into the conduction shell by adding a bit more energy to it. And once it's in the conduction shell, it can move freely. And then it can do it can conduct electricity if it's in that shell. Now, why do we talk about this in this video? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. It says identify that some electrons in solids are shared between atoms and move freely. Right? So here, this is our normal atom again, the atom that is by itself, the atom that is by itself. And here we've talked about the different types of energy levels, and we said that the energy levels are defined; they are clearly defined. So, for example, the valence. The valence electrons will have a certain amount of energy. Any electron within this valence shell, and if we were to jump to the next level, which we call the conduction shell, it would actually have a bit more energy. It goes from one package of energy to the next package of energy. So I'm destroying the conduction shell. Let's say we add some more energy, and one of them might jump from the actual valence into the conduction shell now it would have a bit more energy. And in a single atom, we can, we can actually represent that through a simple band structure. This is a, not a band structure, it's just like a shell structure almost. This is the energy levels. First one is how much energy would have in the valence shell. And the second line would be how much energy it has in a conduction shell. So you can see the black stuff in between, the black gap, this is often something we call a forbidden energy gap. And it's forbidden because I said earlier, we can't have any electrons in between these gaps, right? These gaps, it's not possible because energy comes in quantities and defined quantities. So it can only jump as discrete packages of, of energy. It can't be in between these packages of energy. So that's why we have this forbidden energy gap, which is the energy that has to overcome to jump from one level to the next. But we can see there's these lines. We've got energy going up here. So the, the more energy you have, they're usually the ones that are in the conduction band, less energy are the ones in the valence band, but they all have the same. So valence electrons all have the same energy when it comes to a single atom that's by itself. Now this is a bit different when we have a solid. Solid is where they're always close together, they're quite close together. So this is, for example, these are all silicon atoms, and what we're going to do now is we're going to bring them a bit closer together. And if we bring them a bit closer together, what tends to happen is they tend to overlap. Right, so they tend to overlap. And when they overlap, that means now you're going to have a couple of issues that come about because they've overlapped. So we have some overlapping happen. So you can see the valence shell, which is the first shell in each of these, the valence shell. Beforehand, they were all of the actual electrons had a well-defined energy level. But now, because for example, this electron here, this one, is a bit closer to the positive nucleus of this atom, it's going to be attracted, a bit more attracted to this positive nucleus than, for example, this atom. This atom will be a bit further away, so it'll be a bit less attracted. So now, because they're also tied together, what happens is, even in the valence, valence shell, the valence shell, we're going to have different energy levels for different electrons. So a valence shell has different energy levels for different electrons, whereas beforehand they all have the same amount of energy. And what that means is we have, instead of having just one line, we have something called a band. Right? So this is the band structure of, for example, silicon. Or something similar to this would be the band structure of silicon. So what you can see here, energy going up, and you can see here there's an actual, not just one line, but many lines. So in the middle would be the average, so this middle part would be the average amount of energy and you have some of the electrons having a bit more. They might be you know, a, bit, a bit further away from the actual nucleus of an atom, whereas other ones will have a bit less. They might be the ones which are closer to the nucleus of an atom. But the average would be roughly there. So now we're going to have some which will have probably even enough energy to jump from the conduction shell, uh, from the valence shell into the conduction shell, because they have such slightly more average, slightly bit more energy. Whereas the other ones will have so little energy that they're far away from the conduction shell. So what happens is some 
of these, the ones which have the most energy, will jump from the valence shell into the conduction shell, even at room temperature. Some of these will jump from the, from the valence to conduction, whereas other ones will stay in the conduction the whole time. And that means, again, even with something like this, this is silicon, this is not an actual metal. Silicon, they're going to be, there's going to be some of these electrons which are going to be freely moving because they have had enough energy to move into the conduction band, whereas other ones will be stationary and they'll be stuck. And one really important one as well is obviously metal. So I'll talk about metal more in the future. But with metal, you have, this is just, you know, your positive nuclei of your atoms in your metal lattice, and you have your electrons, which are these ones here, and here, there, it's like a sea of electrons. Every electron, every valence electron, is the same as a conduction electron. So in a metal, you basically have all of your electrons freely moving. So they move freely, more or less all of them. We're going to talk about that more as well. So you're in your metal lattice, in your metals, we have all valence electrons being conduction electrons, which means all valence electrons are moving freely. And this is what you need to know for a stop point. It says, identify that some electrons and solids are shared between atoms and move freely. So in metals and in some semi-metals, uh, semiconductors, or, or in this case, actually also semi-metals, we have electrons moving freely. In the case of metals, all, most of them or all of them. In the case of, of silicon, for example, only a few of them. And in the case of some of your non-metals, so for example, plastic or wood, it would actually be almost none. We'll cover that as well very soon. But that's the main gist you should get out of this video. And, and some of the other stuff I covered here, it's just helping you to be able to appreciate the next content that comes up soon, because that's where we cover more of this in detail as well. But I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.